For as long as I've been in security, HTTP has been a very easy protocol to analyze. But recently, with HTTP2 and HTTP3, things got a lot more difficult. Now, if you've never seen these protocols before, it may be because they're normally encrypted. But if you ever decrypt traffic and look at HTTP2, it is wildly different than the previous version of HTTP. If you haven't analyzed HTTP before, go back to the previous episode and learn the fundamentals before watching this video. And if you're ready, let's dive in to HTTP2. Okay, welcome back to 12 Days of Defense. My name is John Hubbard. Today we're gonna to be going over HTTP2, a quick crash course in what you need to know to understand transactions, extract files, and things like that. So let's jump right in. First off, I wanna talk about HTTP2 in comparison, in theory, to HTTP1. In this picture here, we have a traditional HTTP 1.1 connection where there's a set of headers, uh, and then there is a content section beneath that, uh, where it's sending message hello. In HTTP2, all of this data is still there. We still have headers, we still have a method, we still have a path, and we still have a body of the message, but it's broken up into different pieces, into what is called a headers frame and a data frame. If we scroll down to this picture here, you can see a little bit better idea of what's going on, and I'm gonna include this link in the description down below. The connection, as opposed to the original HTTP 1.1 version, HTTP2 uses a single TCP connection. Within that single TCP connection, there are multiple streams that each have their own unique ID number. Within those streams, we have messages going back and forth, and those messages are the HTTP transactions that you're used to from HTTP version one. They have a path, they have the headers, they have the content. But each of these items are broken up further into frames. And so in this case, from this picture, you can see we have a request message going out. It is inside the headers frame. We get all the details from the headers. And then coming back from the server, we see that there is a headers frame, which is separate from a data frame. All of this is contained inside a stream called number one. And so when we jump into Wireshark, keep this in mind. Uh, stream numbers are gonna be important for tracking your connections and seeing the multiple headers and data frames that are going to be included in any HTTP2 transaction. So now let's take a look at the real thing. If I jump over to Wireshark here, I have a sample capture of a PCAP that contains HTTP2, and I filtered it down to just HTTP2 transactions. Looking at this screen, you can immediately see that this is a very, very different protocol than the original HTTP. Uh, we see magic and settings and Windows updates and headers and data frames, and we see all these brackets next to it. One of the key things to understand is when you're looking at these numbers, such as this one, for example, this number is the stream identifier. As we showed right here, remember we said stream one? This is saying this is part of stream 15. If you're trying to keep straight a transaction and a set of messages in HTTP2, you want to be looking at these numbers. What we can do is we can say uh, HTTP2 dot stream ID equals equals 15, for example, and that will filter down what we're seeing here. Now, stream ID 15 may have been used in multiple different connections because it tends to just kind of start at low numbers and count up. So we're just going to look at this first one here. There's a GET request that's going to this IP address. And if you wanted to see the headers for this, you could right click, hit follow stream, and then like our traditional HTTP, well, if you click this, oh, it doesn't really work all that well. Why is that? Because the headers are compressed. And so what we need to do with this is we actually have to let Wireshark interpret the headers for us. So to do that, you click on a frame that says headers in it. That's a key thing. Headers and data are separate. There are other types of frames as well. We're going to be ignoring those. Uh, mostly what you need to look at for analyzing HTTP2 are just the ones that say headers or the ones that say data. There's other ones and they're kind of control messages and things like that. So we look at the headers frame for stream 15. We see this right here, HTTP2. There's kind of two different sections in here. We unfold the headers and there we go. We see it is still a GET request. We still see the path as you would have in the old versions of HTTP. There's still a host name, but instead of the host header, it's now called authority. That's a item to note. And then we have user agents and we have all the other stuff uh, that could be included in one of these uh, headers. Mostly this is the same as HTTP2 or HTTP1 rather, 
but it is in a different format and you have to look at it like this as opposed to in the plain text bytes uh, as we did with the previous versions of HTTP. Now, the next thing you might be saying is, well, how do I dump files out of this? Well, let's take a look at some of these other transactions and see if we can see a file that's being downloaded and try to extract it. One of the useful filters you might want to use if we're doing this task is http2.headers.method equals equals get. If we do that, then we're going to see all the git requests. And we can pick one of these. Here is tia.png. I don't know what that is. It is from stream 17. If we hit follow HTTP2 stream, it will put a filter on this for just HTTP stream ID 17. It's going to show us that. We can't really use it. This is the way that you want to focus in on a single set of Git requests and then the response to that request. You have to look at it by stream at this point. So we have our Git request, we have a response header packet, and then separately we have a data packet. And all of these are stream 17. So we can look at the response. There are the headers for the response. Same as in HTTP 1, we get our status. We get some of these other date headers and things like that. But if you want to get the file itself, you have to find the corresponding data frame. And this is why I say mostly just pay attention to headers and data frames. The rest of it probably won't be too relevant. Within this, you click on it. And then inside, again, we have HTTP2 data. And in there, there are a few additional bytes and things that aren't the file that we want to actually extract. The file itself starts right about here. So if you click on that, you can see it, but Wireshark actually makes it immediately available if you just click on PNG because it understands the file type. Let's pretend this wasn't here. If you just click on this and you hit export packet bytes and then we save it to tia.png, that has now saved off the file. You cannot go to file, export objects, HTTP2 because it does not exist. Wireshark does not understand how to do this. As of right now, December 2020, you must do it this manual way. Sometimes these data frames are actually broken up into multiple different pieces and you have to find the one that reassembles the whole thing as well, which can add additional complexity, but the process is basically the same. So let's see if we just carve that correctly. Going to our day 10 folder, if I use Firefox and open TIA, dot png there we go tiny little png there we successfully extracted the file so that's what it takes to extract files from http2 and to narrow down on some of the details you might want to view let's go back to our traffic notice there are these settings that are stream id 0 headers data headers a different set of headers for 19 let's say we wanted to look at stream 19 stream id equals equals 19. There we go, we could focus just on this. And you can see, again, headers, data, headers, data, headers, data. Let's say you wanted to filter it down just to frames that were header frames and data frames. You can do that too. HTTP dot, uh, HTTP2 dot header or HTTP2 dot data dot data. That will show us everything in the capture that is just headers and data frames. That could be a useful thing you might wanna look at. Beyond that, if you want to filter out any other specific header, you generally can address it by the name that you see when you unfold these headers frames and scroll down. So if you wanted to filter down something by authority, uh, conceivably you could do that as well by using http.header.authority. And then if in this case, if you wanted to filter it down to Google, you could say consent.google.com. And there you go. So if you're looking for all the traffic from a single domain name, you can do that as well. That could be useful too. This is just looking at normal HTTP2 traffic. Let's take a pretty common scenario and see if we can figure it out now based on what HTTP2 looks like. What I did was I went to a phishing site and I captured traffic as I entered credentials as if I were a user falling prey to that phishing site. So we know that when a user types a name and password into a website and they hit submit, it's going to be sent as a post request. That's how it works. So we are looking for a post request in all of these HTTP2 
messages. So we can type http2.headers.method equals equals post and look at all of the post requests. Now you'll notice in here we have a lot of post requests to slash DNS query. This is the DOH traffic that we talked about in the DOH video. We're ignoring that for now. There is just this one item right here. So we have stream 35. If we're interested in only looking at stream 35, which we are because that would be the one it was submitted to, we can just use that to filter it down. And then we are looking at the headers for the post request going out to files action PHP. We are looking at the data that is going out to the server. And then we can see the answer that came back from the server with a headers and data frame combined in a single packet right here. We are looking for evidence of a username and password being sent in the post request, which means it would be part of the body of the client to server message. So that would be this right here. If we click on this, we can then unfold these items here. This is what it would normally look like. We can click on the data section here, but it actually has it broken out here as a separate HTML form URL encoded set of data, and it interprets it for us. There we go. That is exactly what I typed into that website. Username, my username and password equals my secret password. With this, you can also see in the headers frame, the user agent, the URI, and all of the other details about this. What came back from it? Well, we can look at this frame here and we can see it was an Apache web server. We see some dates and we see the data stream that came back, which just so happened to be what looks to be a gzip encoded bit of HTML. We can go down to here and see that what it gave us was status. Okay. So that is our post request going to the phishing site. And that is the workflow you'll have to use for HTTP2. Depending on whether you're wanting to extract a file, it's a little bit different than HTTP1. You have to manually carve out the items by kind of unfolding these data frames. If you're looking at headers, you have to look at a header frame. If you want to filter it down, uh, the easiest way to do it is usually by the stream ID and then narrow it down to the data or headers frame you're interested in or the method that was used. And with this kind of information, you can export and analyze HTTP2. It's just a little bit different than what you saw before, but all the headers and everything else still apply. One detail I want to bring up is what if you want to dump every single file out of this capture? In the old HTTP, you could go to file, export objects, HTTP, and then it would give you all of the things that were in the entire capture and you could save them out. Since this does not support HTTP2 file automatic carving, you need to do this in a different way. In fact, you actually cannot do it at all with Wireshark, at least right now. What I have found as a solution for this is if you run the program Network Miner, then you can dump all of the data out of an HTTP2 PCAP. The caveat to that is the PCAP has to be unencrypted. So if you are taking pre-master secrets, you're telling Wireshark to apply those secrets to a encrypted PCAP, that actually won't get you where you need to go. So if you wanna do HTTP traffic and then you wanna carve everything out of it, this is the process I found that you would have to follow. There is a tool that you can get called Polar Proxy. And Polar Proxy will do an active interception of traffic between a client and an HTTPS server. What it will tee out here is an unencrypted PCAP. So if you want to dump all the files out, you would need to set up Polar Proxy, tell Firefox to use Polar Proxy as a proxy, and then let Polar Proxy save a PCAP file for you. Take that PCAP over to Network Miner and then carve all the files automatically out of that. Unfortunately, right now, as of December 2020, that seems to be the only easy way that I could find to do it. I asked some of the other instructors at SANS and no one seemed to know a better way of doing this right now. So those are the tools that we have. I'm sure the tools will catch up in the future, but that's where we're stuck with right now. One final thing I want to note here. You may have heard me mention HTTP3 before. HTTP3 now exists as well, and it's largely the same once you get down to the data compared to HTTP2, but the key difference is at the transport layer. HTTP3 is embedded in a protocol called QUIC, which is Q-U-I-C, and it is a wrapper that's going to help transfer this data in this format even faster and even more efficiently. Wireshark really struggles to decode QUIC right now, and in fact, I couldn't even find a way to easily make it work to demo that for you. But understand that any web server that speaks HTTP3 right now 
we'll be using UDP to communicate TLS encrypted, similar to HTTP to format data back and forth from your clients to the internet. So you now have to look at UDP 443 to find your traffic as well. Quick and HTTP3 are not the majority of traffic right now, but expect it to happen very, very quickly. It's a more efficient protocol to use. And so as soon as web server software catches up and companies start using it, it's definitely going to quickly become the predominant standard. So when it comes to analysis, if you can decrypt it, if you can use Wireshark, it's probably going to look mostly like HTTP2, but around it will be UDP and this quick format instead. So there's your crash course in HTTP 2.0. Like I said at the beginning of this video, the headers and everything is still kind of there. You just have to navigate through Wireshark differently to pull it out. So it's definitely worth trying this out. If you're interested in looking at a sample of HTTP 2 traffic, I will put a link down in the description where you can download an already unencrypted PCAP of HTTP 2 data, or you could just generate it yourself using the tactics that we talked about in the DOH day, for example, to decode your own HTTP2 traffic. That's probably the better method anyway, so that you get used to it. All right, that's it for today. So if you liked what you saw here, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos coming out in the future. If you are interested, we have some free resources and classes listed in the description. Check those out as well, and I will catch you on the next episode of the 12 Days of Defense.